In this video, we will review the quantum postulates for the hydrogen atom. The Schrodinger equation is H psi equals E psi. For the hydrogen atom, this H is the kinetic energy of the electron over here, plus the potential energy. In this case, it's the attraction between the proton and the electron. 4 pi epsilon is a constant. R is the distance between the electron and the proton. Now we'll use the atomic units. The mass of the electron is one atomic unit of mass. The charge of the electron is negative one atomic unit of charge. The charge of the proton is positive one atomic unit of charge. H bar is one atomic unit as well. The last fundamental atomic unit is one over four pi epsilon. It's defined to be one atomic unit. And then if we look at this equation, each bar is one, the mass of the electron is one, electron charge squared is negative one squared. So this is also one. And then 1 over 4 pi epsilon is 1. Therefore, the Schrodinger equation of the hydrogen atom is this, in atomic units. We then convert x, y, z to r, theta, phi, spherical polar coordinates. This is the x, y, and z axis. And then we have r the distance between the electron and the nucleus. Theta is the angle between Z and R. Phi defines the angle of the projection of this R vector on the XY plane. So this is the three-dimensional R vector. If we do a projection of this vector on the XY plane, we have this dash line, and this dash line forms an angle with the x-axis this angle is defined to be phi. Theta corresponds to the latitude of Earth. Phi is the longitude. Theta is between zero and pi. Phi is between zero and two pi. So the range of theta is pi, the range of phi is two pi. Uh, now let's do the conversion x equals r times sine theta times cosine phi. So this projection is r times cosine theta. So this one is r times cosine theta. And then we do one more projection of this r times sine theta times cosine phi. We get the x coordinates. And r sine theta times sine phi we get y coordinates. So over here. How about z? z is simply r times cosine theta, because again, this is vector here, this angle is theta, so we do a projection of r on the z axis. The value of the z position is r times cosine theta. We can also express r, theta, and phi in terms of x, y, and z. R is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. We do not define theta and phi directly. Tangent theta is the square root of x squared plus y squared over z. The square root of x squared plus y squared is the distance between here and here. And this divided by r, that's the value of Oh, I'm sorry, this divided by z, that's the value of tangent theta over here. And tangent phi is y over x. We can just look at these two equations. And y divided by x is sine phi over cosine phi, which is tangent phi. All right, now, in the polar coordinates, the Schrodinger equation of the hydrogen atom becomes this. It looks more complicated, but we can actually solve this equation. 
Again, over here, the highlighted part is the sum of delta squared over delta x squared, delta squared over delta y squared, and delta squared over delta z squared. By solving this short equation, we'll get an infinite number of solutions. The first solution corresponds to n equals 1 n is the principal quantum number. That's the 1s atomic orbital of the hydrogen atom. The function is e to the power of negative r. When n equals 2, we have four more eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, which is the 2s orbital here, 2 minus r times the exponential function. Pay attention here. The 1s orbital is e to the power of negative r. The 2s orbital is 2 minus r times e to the power of negative r over 2. So there's a coefficient here. And then we have 2p orbitals, three of them, 2px, 2py, 2pz. 2px is x times e to the power of negative r over 2. And this is y times e to the power of negative r over 2. 2pz is z times e to the power of negative r over 2. So what's in common here? They all have this exponential function e to the power of negative r over 2. Now let's look at the nodal surface of this 2s orbital. It's clear that when r equals 2, this wave function is 0. Therefore, we observe a spherical nodal surface at the radius of 2 atomic unit. One atomic unit of length is 0 0.529 angstroms, or 0 0.529 times 10 to the power of negative 10 meters. How about these three p orbitals? They each has a nodal surface at x equals 0, y equals 0, or z equals 0. When n equals 3, we have 3s orbital, like this. Pay attention to this exponential function. It's now e to the power of negative r over 3. So again, this exponential function is going to be negative e to the power of negative r over n. And then it's multiplied by a second order quadratic function. When you have a quadratic function, we can set this to 0 and get two roots. The two roots correspond to the two spherical nodal surfaces of the 3s orbital. And then these three are the 3p orbitals. In each of the three wave functions, you see e to the power of negative r over 3. And also, we observe two nodal surfaces here. One is spherical. When r equals 6, the wave function is 0. When x equals 0, the wave function is also 0. Therefore, we observe two nodal surfaces in the 3px atomic orbital. Same here, when r equals 6 or y equals 0. When r equals 6 or z equals 0. Now let's look at the five d orbitals. The first one is this. This is the 3d z squared orbital. It's 3z squared minus r squared times e to the power of r over 3. By looking at this equation, we know there are two nodal surfaces. They correspond to 3z squared equals r squared, or the square root of 3 times z equals plus minus r. Simply put, when z is equal to r divided by the square root of 3, or negative r divided by the square root of 3, we have a nodal surface. Now, these three share some similarity. dxz is simply x times z times this exponential function. Over here is just yz, xy. In each of the three cases, there are two nodal surfaces. Over here, when x equals 0 or z equals 0, the wave function is 0. Therefore, we have two nodal surfaces. Same here, same here. The last one, when x equals y or negative y, we have two nodal surfaces in this wave function as well. 
So pay attention here. If we compare this wave function and this wave function over here, when x equals 0 or y equals 0, this wave function is 0. Over here, when y equals x or negative x, this wave function is 0. So there's a difference between this wave function and this wave function regarding the locations of the nodal surfaces. How about the energy of those atomic orbitals or the energy of the electron in this atomic orbitals? They are the same thing. The equation is very simple. It's negative 1 over 2n squared. So when n equals 1, for example, 1s orbital, the energy is negative 1 over 2. How about 2s and 2p orbitals? Negative 1 over 8. How about 3s, 3p, and 3d orbitals? It's negative 1 over 18 atomic unit. One atomic unit is 4.35974 times 10 to the power of negative 18 joule. So this is the energy per electron. But if we convert this to kilojoule per mole, it's going to be 2625.5 kilojoule per mole. What's the difference between this number and this number? The f gadrel constant. I will now use two atomic orbitals to illustrate the use of the quantum mechanical postulates. Which two? The 1s orbital, the 2pz orbital. The equation of the 1s orbital is e to the power of negative r. The 2pz wave function is z times e to the power of negative r over 2. And z, remember, is r times cosine theta. So this part is z. Let's look at postulate 1. Quantum mechanical wave functions are single-valued, continuous, and finite. This is single-valued, continuous, and finite. Remember, r is the length of the vector. So this r is from 0 to infinity, and this function is single-valued. It's continuous. Well, how do we know it's continuous? If we can take the first derivative of this function, then it's continuous. And also, it's finite. Because even when r approaches infinity, this is finite. When r is 0, this is also finite. Same here, 2pz wave function is this. It's single-valued, continuous, and finite. Postulate 2. Uh, every physical observable has a corresponding quantum mechanical operator. This statement applies to uh, both wave functions here. Now, for a physical observable with a corresponding operator A, if the wave function, so either of these two, is an eigenfunction of the A operator, we will be able to get the eigenvalue, the lowercase a, and this a is the value of the physical observable. Now let's uh, do one example here. This 1s and 2pz wave functions are the eigenfunctions of this Hamiltonian operator. What's the physical meaning of this? H, this is the total energy operator. So we're going to apply this H to the 1s wave function and uh, obtain its eigenvalue. H psi equals E psi. So what's this H? This H is the sum of the kinetic energy operator. I highlighted the kinetic energy operator and also the potential energy operator, which is negative 1 over r. We apply these two operators to the wave function side separately. And then we're going to plug in the wave function of the 1s orbital, e to the power of negative r, so over here. And then it's just calculus. Fortunately, d e to the power of negative r over d theta is 0. And also this part is 0, this second derivative of this e to the power of negative r with respect to phi is also zero. Only because this wave function does not contain theta or phi. It does not depend on theta or phi. So we have just two terms left, this part and this part. All right? This part gives you the kinetic energy part. And this second part is the potential energy part. 
Uh, and then we just do calculus, the differential calculus. We take the first derivative of this e to the power of negative r, because this is the operator closest to the wave function. We apply this one first over here. The result is negative e to the power of negative r. We have one additional negative sign here. Therefore, it becomes positive. All right, so it's here. And then we copy this here. Remember, in differential calculus, the Chen rule tells us when we take this first derivative of e to the power of negative r, the result is e to the power of negative r times the first derivative of negative r, which is negative e to the power of negative r. Again, there's one additional negative sign here. Therefore, this becomes positive. Over here, we'll use the product rule. r squared becomes 2r e to the power of negative r becomes negative e to the power of negative r and then multiply by this r squared. Okay, And then from here, it's just simple algebra. You just do some sim simplification, some cancellation. In the end, the result is a constant multiplied by the original wave function e to the power of negative r. The eigenvalue is negative one half. Therefore, the energy of the one acid electron is negative one half atomic unit. Uh, this e to the power of negative r is not normalized. So how do we normalize this? It's very simple. Uh, the integral of the square, uh, squared modulus of this should be one. So we simply just need to multiply this by a normalization fa factor n. However, if you include this n here, you will see the result is the same. You will just get the negative one half times the normalized wave function. So don't worry too much about the normalization factor. Now let's work on the 2pz orbital. This is the wave function here. Again, we just apply the Hamiltonian, the total energy operator, to the 2pz op, uh, wave function. Uh, this 2pz wave function does not depend on phi. Therefore, we can delete the phi operator. You have the r operator here. You have the theta operator here. And this is the phi operator. We apply this phi operator over here to the function of theta and r. You get zero. And then um, I skipped all those differential calculus here. You just need to derive this carefully. The result is going to be the original wave function here, r times cosine theta times e to the power of negative r over 2 times a constant negative 1 over 8. Therefore, the total energy of the 2pz electron in the hydrogen atom is negative 1 over 8 atomic unit. It's a negative number. Why it's a negative number? Actually, its potential energy is negative. Its kinetic energy is positive. Possibly four. Now we'll look at the potential energy of the 1s electron or the 2pz electron. Unfortunately, neither the 1s or the 2pz atomic orbital is an eigenfunction of the potential energy operator. So positive 4 tells us we can estimate the value, I'm sorry, we can calculate the weighted average of the value of the physical observable by doing this operation. So on top we have an integral which is the complex conjugate of the wave function psi on the left hand side and then we apply a to the wave function and this a being applied to the wave function on the right hand side. On the, on the bottom we have a similar integral except this a psi is replaced with this psi. So the bottom integral is a bit simpler. The top one you need to apply the a operator to psi. If you want to get the average value of this physical observable. Now let's look at the potential energy 
of the wireless electron or the 2PZ electron. All you need to do is write out the notation of the weighted average of the potential energy. It's negative 1 over R. Again, it's actually negative electron charge squared over 4 pi epsilon R. But the charge of the electron is negative 1. 4 pi epsilon is one atomic unit as well. Therefore, this part is the potential energy in atomic unit. So now we insert the potential energy operator here and apply this operator to the wave function. So we're going to do this first and then do a multiplication and then followed by the integral and then divided by this denominator. We will be able to get the weighted average of the potential energy. Uh, what about this d tau? d tau is the volume element. In Cartesian coordinates, d tau is dx times dy times dz. In polar coordinates, d tau is r squared times sine theta times dr times d theta times d phi. If you are interested in this, uh, you may want to take the more advanced multivariable calculus or you can Google this uh, on the internet. Uh, let's look at the uh, 1s orbital first. 1s orbital, e to the power negative r. We just need to plug in this here and here, here and here. Uh, this is a real function. How can we get the complex conjugate of a function? We need to replace every single i, the square root of negative 1, with negative i. Fortunately, there's no i in this expression, therefore the complex conjugate of this function is itself. In general, the complex conjugate of any real function is itself, because there's no i. We just plug this in here and here, and also plug this in here and here, and then evaluate the integrals. It's really complicated over here. We have top integral here, we have the bottom integral here, the top and bottom differ by, look at this, over here, this is the potential energy operator being applied to the wave function. This is just the wave function itself. This is a triple integral. It can be separated into three single integrals. It's the product of a single integral of r, a single integral of theta, and a single integral of phi. Same here for the denominator you have the product of three single integrals. Fortunately, the integrals of theta and phi cancel. Therefore, we have just a simple single integral of r on top, also a integral of r on the bottom. And then look, we have r squared here. Don't forget that, r squared here. And over here, when you apply this operator to the wave function, in this case, it's just a simple multiplication. So this is a multiplication here. And then we just need to uh, evaluate uh, both integrals. I'm going to show you an example of using Wolfram Alpha to get uh, uh, one of these two integrals. You do control click. Over here I just typed up integrate e to the power of negative 2r times r squared with r from 0 to infinity the result is 0 0.25. So over here, this is the integral here. And you can tell I'm talking about the denominator. Uh, it's uh, 1 over 4 or 0 0.25. Well, uh, you can also integrate the top uh, numerator, uh, which is just r to the power of 1. And there's a negative sign here. So that's the top integral, the result is negative 0.25. So really it's going to be just negative with this negative sign, negative 0.25 divided by positive 0.25, the result is negative 1. And then we know the potential energy of this electron is negative 1 atomic unit. It's negative because again it's attraction between the electron and the nucleus. What about the weighted average of the kinetic energy? Well, there are two ways to do it. One way is you still use 
this is partially full. And then you apply the kinetic energy operator to the wave function here. That's more tedious. The second way is neat. What we need to do is we use the total energy minus the potential energy. We know the exact value of the total energy is negative one half atomic unit. The average value of the potential energy is negative one. So total energy minus the potential energy is the kinetic energy. Negative one half minus negative one is positive one half atomic unit of energy. What's the speed of the electron? Because kinetic energy is one half mv squared, this kinetic energy of the electron, 1s electron, is 1 half atomic unit, and the mass of the electron is 1 atomic unit. Therefore, the speed of this 1s electron is 1 atomic unit of speed, which is 2.2 .2 times 10 to the power of 6 meter per second. At this speed, the electron can fly from Seattle, Washington, to Miami, Florida within two seconds. To review the atomic unit of speed and some other quantities, you can watch this video again. Now, the 2pz electron, same thing. We just need to use partially four. The integrals look much more complicated because the wave function of 2pz is z times e to the power of negative r over two, and z is r times cosine theta. But again, the integrals of theta and phi cancel. So really, you just have the integrals of r on top and on the bottom. Remember, there's a negative sign here. So I put the negative sign in front of this fraction. And on top, you have e to the power of negative r. Why? You have e to the power of negative r over 2 and e to the power of negative r over 2. Together, it's e to the power of negative r. And then you have uh, r to the power of 3. So we can also use this Wolfram Alpha, but what you need to do is you just need to make some changes, you know, r to the power of three over here, and then we'll get the value of this integral. Uh, it's negative 24. So again, it's negative 24. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't think I typed this right. Now it's correct. It's negative six on top. So negative six on top. The bottom is r to the power of four. So let's look at this number. And the denominator is positive, so. The value is 24. So negative six over 24 is negative one over four. Therefore, the weighted average of the potential energy between the 2pz electron and the hydrogen nucleus is negative 1 over 4 atomic unit. What about the kinetic energy? Again, the total energy is negative 1 over 8. The potential energy is negative 1 over 4. You use total energy minus the potential energy. The result is positive 1 over 8 atomic unit. And again, let's review the difference between the 1s electron and the 2pz electron. The 2pz electron has a total energy of negative 1 over 8. The total energy of the 1s electron is negative 1 over 2. So it takes energy to promote the electron from the 1s orbital to the 2pz orbital. How much? 3 eighths atomic unit of energy. Another result is more surprising. The kinetic energy of the 2pz electron is 1 over 8 atomic unit. The kinetic energy of the 1s electron is 1 over 2 atomic unit. Therefore, after the electron is excited from the 1s orbital to the 2pz orbital, it moves slower. How much slower? 50% slower. 